Okay, shalom everyone, and thank you so much for joining us this evening. Uh, my name is Moshe Samuels, and I'm the CEO of Shazul. I want to acknowledge that on this uh, Zoom call tonight, we have with us members of the Jewish Peoplehood Coalition, which is convened by the Re'ut Group, uh, professionals from a wide range of Israeli nonprofits, Israeli diplomats, educators, uh, current and former shlichim of the Jewish Agency, students at Haifa University's Ruderman program, and many activists in the Ethiopian Jewish community in Israel. Um, this serves as testimony to the fact that we are seeing an increase in the amount of Israelis who care deeply about Jewish communities around the world and want to learn more about them, a goal that both the Jewish Agency and Shazul, among many other partners in this field, are working so hard to achieve. We initiated this webinar as a result of a fascinating conversation that took place in the coalition's WhatsApp group uh, in the aftermath of the murder of George Floyd a few weeks ago. In the conversation, we realized that many of us find the term Jew of color to be challenging, that we lack familiarity with the experience of people of color in America at large and specifically in the Jewish community, and that we are uncertain if and how the conversation on race and color happening across the Atlantic is relevant to our existence in Israel. I hope to address these points in tonight's program. I want to thank Dr. Ilan Ezrahi, our friend and mentor, for encouraging us to create this program and to the Jewish Agency, and especially my colleague, Pina Aginyahu, Director of uh, Interfaces and Synergy at the Strategic Planning and Content Unit of Jaffe, for your partnership on this webinar. Pina, take it away. Thank you. Um, so today, we have three uh, phenomenal uh, women that will share with us a little bit more uh, into the deep of the conversation. Uh, we have Rabbi Sandra Lawson, a Black Jew activist and spokesperson for the Jews of Color community. We have Senior Rabbi Felicia Sol uh, from the Bnei Shun Synagogue in Manhattan, and Mazar Bisuar, an Interim Director and Spokesperson of the Association of Ethiopian Jews in Israel. And we would like to start right away and uh, start our panel with a question to Sandra, to Rabbi Sandra. And I, I would like you to share, you know, many of us in Israel don't really understand the term of Jew of color. Why it is so important to straight your color. And can you please share a little bit more about your experience as a person of color in the United States today and how it's informed your identity? How does color play out in Jewish spaces you have experiences and that lead you to identify the Jew of color? Thank you, Prina. First of all, I want to say that, um, first of all, thank you all for having me. Um, I, I, one of the things I love about this, uh, this, these type of things is that I get to meet different people, get to travel the world and never leave my little home off. <laughs> um, and I also want to say that thank you for the, the honorific of spokesperson for Jews of color, but I do, definitely do not see myself as a spokesperson for Jews of color. I'm just a person who has opinions um, and uh, you know, black and brown people in the United States um, as, and Jews of color in the United States have a diversity of opinions and thoughts and things like that. Um, but I do have a platform and I'm, and I'm, I'm aware of that. Um, so the term Jews of color, to, to do a little bit of context without giving a whole history and without taking up way too much time, um, first of all, you have to understand how, or try to understand the sort of history of the United States. And the history of the United States is based off of racial ideas. Um, and so, you know, there's, you know, the digital... Um, there's someone that is not muted, and there's, I'm hearing background, if... if uh, okay. <laughs> um, and you know, and 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 our country was designed from the very beginning to privilege one group of people over another group of people, and those people who had privilege were white and men, and more specifically, white men who owned property from basically Great Britain. So that means other European groups did not have the same privilege as those people did. And eventually, over time, um, uh, whiteness grew, and so other European groups were able to sort of assimilate into whiteness. That also meant European Jews were able to assimilate into to whiteness. Now, as far as the term Jews of color, I have no idea who started using that term, but this is part of a larger challenge, a lot of larger issue of how we see racial groups in the United States. And um, the, way I, uh, the way I use the term Jews of color is a sort of reminder that not all Jews um, can't come from Eastern Europe. Now, in the United States, we tend to lift up 
certain narratives. And the narratives that get the narrative that gets lifted up in the Jewish community in the United States is that is this is the narrative of Eastern European Jewry. And we often forget about other groups of Jews. And so um, Jews have been in the United States long enough that that our demographics are starting to look like the rest of the American population. So whatever racial demographics you see in the larger US population, you're gonna to start to see them in the, in, the, in the Jewish population. And depending on which study you look at, there's been three studies recently that place um, Jews of color, so non-European looking Jews, um, anywhere from 10 to 15 to 20% of the Jewish population. Also, Jew of color is a self-identifying term, and so people can um, self-identify. And there are Jews of color who, who aren't white and don't have are, and are not white or are not Ashkenazi, and they may present them may, they may present outwardly as white, but they don't see themselves that way, and they use the term Jews of, Jew of color. I am someone that I identify as a Jew of color, and the world sees me as a person of color, and more specifically, the world sees me, or at least the United States sees me as a black person. So, departy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So that was that. And we would like now to uh, welcome Mazal to the panel. And you know, as we listen all together to your to Sandra's experience, I would like you to uh, reflect back and share with us what resonated with you as a Black Jew living in Israel, if at all you see yourself as a Black Jew. You know, it's just a definition, as Rabbi Sandra said. And what do you see is similar in your experience, and where are the differences between Jews of color in the United States and in Israel? If you think it is something that even can be applicable to the Ethiopian Jews in, in your opinion in Israel, or maybe it's a, two different stories. Um, hi, everyone. <laughs> um, first, I, I, I have to say it's amazing how um, even though we live in a, uh, totally different places with different history and narratives, we still have the same, uh, I still, have the same experience and thoughts as Sandra, as Rabbi Sandra has. Um, I guess you can say that the issue with the narrative about Judaism and you know how does a Jewish person looks like and how does he act, how does he talk, and where uh, where did he come from uh, is something that we also have here in Israel. And um, the. I think that the experience is very similar, but here in Israel we have a certain, we have another aspect, which is the fact that um, being Jewish is also being Israeli, which makes our situation a little bit more complex. Uh, the second thing that I can think of is the fact that here in Israel, unfortunately, uh, we do not have decades of confronting the issue of racism uh, straightforward and we we basically in my opinion we we don't really have a serious discourse and developed discourse about racism so we have the same uh, I guess you can say issue but with even more complex um, obstacles to deal with um, the in, in my opinion the fact that people here don't talk racism don't you know, especially in our racism that is based on skin color, uh, we talk a little bit, a little bit about racism towards Palestinians. We have, uh, you know, a, a long time uh, issue with uh, Mizrahim, but no one really want to talk about, you know, what does it mean to be black and Jewish here in Israel, and how uh, and how difficult it is. And I want to say another thing about. Um, uh, uh, about being, uh, about the fact that being Jewish, that my religion is also my nationality here, basically it shapes, uh, I believe it shapes our story from the, from the get-go, from the very uh, uh, tipping point of our relationship with Israel. The, the fact that, you know, the narrative that Rabbi Sandra talked about is, is basically, I, I call it monopoly. It's a monopoly over the answers to the questions as, just like I said, who is Jewish? How does it look like? How, how his religion looks like? And, sorry. And basically, um, that monopoly creates, um, I guess you can say, 
power structure within the Israeli society. And once you have power structure, you have uh, discrimination. And you have discrimination, you have uh, power structures, and no one talks about how Judaism here in Israel is being the means to, uh, to practice racism over black people or, or other people of color. Um, I think I'll stop here. <laughs> So I actually, I actually want to go back to both of you, Rabbi Sandra and Mazel, because I feel in the sake of the people in around this discussion, conversation, that you both uh, such a good professional, you jump right onto the subject and to the items uh, agenda. Uh, but I would like you to share a bit more from your personal experience of, uh, you know, Rabbi Sandra, if you can share a bit of experience of what it's to be black Jew, in a Jewish community. I mean, what do you experience that is actually defined today, the, this movement of people that want to be self-defined as a Jew of color? I'm, I, I'm sure there's some, you know, something in the environment that brought you to that point. And as well with Mazel, I will love you. I mean, I can share my own as well, but I would love you to share, you know, how you experience this personally as an Ethiopian Jew, as in a Black Jew. There's any differences, do you feel like, you feel a different way of behavior of being integrated to the Israel society because you're black, because you're Ethiopian. So if you can bid, and then Felicia, we're gonna to come to you, don't worry. But a bit a bit a bit more from the pers personal perspective, but I feel it's uh, it's important for us to hear and understand. Yeah, I mean, so the, the, the experience I'm going to describe to you are not unique to me. Um, some of the things that I'm going to describe, actually, most of the things I'm going to describe happened to most Jews who were Black and probably many Jews who were Jews of color. Um, anything from being denied entry into uh, sacred space um, or to Jewish spaces. Um, that I've actually never been denied entry, entry into a space, but I have been questioned. And so if I want to go, so let me back a minute. Like for me, if I am traveling and actually this is sort of weighing on my mind right now because my mother is really sick and I know that I'm, that she is going to pass away and I know that I'm going to need a sick, I need, I'm going to need a space to go say Kaddish. Like this is really real for me. And um, whenever I go into unfamiliar Jewish spaces, I have to do a lot of homework before I step into that space. Meaning I'm gonna look at the synagogue's website, I'm gonna read their material, um, and I'm gonna make choices based off of what they say and how they, how they claim to welcome people. And I do that for my own safety and my own protection. That is something that white Jews don't have, I mean, maybe queer Jews do, but um, you know, that is something that, that people who don't have marginalized identities in the Jewish community have to do. Um, I have been in, a, <laughs> so I was in a synagogue of, uh, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago. And actually the rabbi is a good friend of mine now. Um, he doesn't know this story, um, but I was in his, I didn't know him at the time, but I was in his synagogue. And he's no longer the rabbi of that synagogue. But um, I was there with several friends. Um, was like, you know, we took up like two rows and we looked weird. <laughs> I mean, I will say that, you know, um, you know, and we, but we were also racially and ethnically diverse and some of us were queer presenting and some of us weren't, but we had on, you know, really just garb. I mean, my friend Charlie had on tefillin, a tallit and a uh, yarmulke. And um, I had on a prayer shawl and a, and a kippah and, you know, and so forth and so on. And, you know, we were a range of hues um, but we got there really early and, and in, like in many synagogues in America, um, you know, the, the, whoever is in charge of, you know, giving honors was looking for someone to, to, you know, to open the ark or to carry the Torah scroll or whatever. And we were one of the first people in there. And so he comes to our row of, 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 of people and he looks us all up and down and then leans to my friend, Charlie, who is the whitest of us, um, <laughs> and says, who in this row is Jewish? Now, every last one of us had on um, stuff that would make us present as Jewish. Um, and he was, my friend Charlie was like, you're kidding, right? 
<laughs> he said, all of us. And once that dude got that information, he was okay with it. But my friend Charlie was in the middle of the row. So we had to like lean over all of us to do that. I was uh, in a synagogue and it was during the Amidah and I felt someone staring at me. And I, I and, and it was like, it was, and I just finally turned around during the Amidah, which, you know, as a prayer, you're actually not supposed to interrupt. I said, dude, what's going on? Like, what, why, like, am I that, am I bothering you with my praying and bothering you that much that you can't pray? I said a little nicer than that. Um, and I could go on. And also upon the things that I get most of the time is when I walk into any Jewish space. And I'll give you another example. I was recently at, a very large Jewish American conference. And like many of these conferences, rabbis get invited to just special rabbi things. So I was at a dinner, everybody in the room was a rabbi. Every single person in the room was a rabbi. Um, and I saw a rabbi who um, I had a lot of respect for. Um, I learned a lot from him when I was a student, just from his, his teachings. And so I went up to him and I introduced myself. And, and I wanted to thank him. And, um, and then after he introduced me to his wife, the first thing he says is, you know, when did you convert to Judaism or something like that? And I'm pointing this out because um, people, um, the members of the Jewish community, upon meeting someone who looks like me, feel entitled to know personal information about my life upon meeting me. Questions like, when did you convert? How are you Jewish? Don't you have to be Jewish to be a rabbi? Tell me your story. Tell me every little thing about you. And, and, and what I, if, I, if I don't want to answer, if I just want to eat my food, or if I just want to go and pray, and if I just don't feel like engaging, I get met with pushback about why that person needs to know intimate details about my life. Which tells me that this is more than curiosity. This is about you as a white person or as a white Jewish person need to feel safe for me to enter. Um, and I actually, that example that I mentioned early a few moments ago about that rabbi, um, um, when he asked me the question, he then immediately followed up with, I know I'm not supposed to ask you that is what he said. And I just said, yeah, dude, like, why are you asking me? And I just want to eat my food and I really, and, and, and he kept pressuring me. Luckily, there was another rabbi who was an ally and he interrupted. I hadn't met him either. And he's like, are you listening to yourself? <laughs> she just told you, she just wants to like, she was like, wanted to meet you. And now you're like, grilling her with all these questions about why you need to know. And then they had their own personal discussion and then I went my merry way. So that's, yeah, I could go on. I, one of these days I'll write a book about it. <laughs> so that, thank you for that. You know, that's remind me a uh, one story, a small story that when I, I went to buy a mezuzah from like, um, uh, no, a Daika store in Tel Aviv and the person that was a Haredi guy, an ultra Orthodox guy and he looked at me curious to why I'm buying a mezuzah. And he asked me, why do you, why are you buying a mezuzah? I told him my sister is buying a new house and I want to buy her a nice fancy mezuzah. He's like, wait, did you have mezuzah there? I'm like, what do you mean there? You know, in your village in Ikebele, we had something similar, not exactly like you have right now. And then was the following question of, wait a minute, how did you know at all that you're Jewish. I mean, how did you kept your, your roots to Judaism? Uh, so I told them, you know, I know, my mother know how to count seven generations back, you know, in order to know and to follow our forefather and now we're Jewish. Do you know how to follow seven generations back in Europe? I mean, well, that other woman, he felt that he was offending me and that we ended the conversation and didn't buy anything there that went out. But I think this is something, again, as, as, as Mazal described before, that can be similar to some of the experience in Israel, even though the history is different and the, and the question uh, around the race is different and it's not presented in the same way in Israel. So now I'm going to turn back to you, Mazal, if you would like to share. Yeah. I'll share one more story. I'm really sorry, but I just think it's a, it's a silly story. But I was uh, invited to Lane to read Torah for my friend's uh, daughter's bat mitzvah, and, and she's white. Her husband's Mizra is, is Yemenite, um, and they have two black ch children. 
um, who were amazing. And so I was a first year rabbinical student and I was asked to read Torah. So I go up there and um, I, I, I read beautifully. It was fun and everything. And then someone who was a family member or, or uh, loosely associated with the family, who was a white person and said, wow, where did you learn to read Torah? And, <laughs> and I was introduced as a rabbinical student, mind you. Um, and, and I didn't know what to say. I just said, I'm, I'm in school. Like, <laughs> anyway. Um, um, I, I, first of all, I definitely relate to all of the experiences that you just talked about. And also, I, I really do want to stretch the point that you started talking about, Nina. The fact that, you know, our narratives and the history of the places that we live in may be different, but uh, one of the ways that Israelis here uh, object to the idea that we can be racist towards each other, that a Jew person can be racist towards another uh, Jew of color, uh, one of the things that I keep hearing is that you can't say that we're racist. There's no racism here since uh, there wasn't never slavery here. And then you have to explain to people that even though history is different, the sociological phenomena, which is racism and, and discrimination can still exist here. Uh, and we see that, the fact that we can compare notes and experiences about how it does it feel to be a Jew of color or uh, a black Jew, to me, it just, it, it proves that. Um, anyway, um, I'll, 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 I'll give one example, which is a little bit more, I guess you can say, complex. And I would like to say something about the experience of young black Jews here in Israel, Ethiopian Jews, at least from my point of view. Anyway, when I was young, when I was a child, um, my parents didn't have the same last name. My dad had a certain last name, his last name, and my mom had her last name. Now, you need to keep in mind that I lived in a very small town, very conservative. It, it's not like today that it's very obvious that a woman can keep her maiden name. So it was, it was pretty weird for people like, why, why your mother's last name is not the same as yours and your father's? Anyway, it was one of the things that I didn't really knew why, and I had to, I had to deal with it every time. And you know, when I had to give away uh, details of my parents in school or in different um, in different places, I always had to say, "Yeah, they don't have the same uh, um, last name." Anyway, I grew older, and when I was fifteen or sixteen years old. My parents got married. My parents got married uh, in the Rabbanut, in the rabbinical institution here in Israel. I was 15, 16 years old, and it was super weird for me. And I was born and raised in a religious house. I went to a religious school, and I felt like, oh my, I remember, you know, even the fact that I remember the, the shame that I had like, oh my God, my parents are not married. What does it mean? Is it against the, the religion? Uh, well, anyway, so, um, and you know, they didn't even talk to me about it. I found out, like, I saw, uh, I, I was looking for something in a cabinet and I saw the Ketuba and I saw like uh, a small um, album of pictures and, you know, my parents were there and they, they had a Kupa and I was like, that was so super weird. And that was the first time that I talked to my mom and I, I, and I asked her, what is this? And then she told me about, um, you know, when we get to Israel, um, they wanted to convert us. And then she said something about how they, um, the rabbinical institution and basically the state of Israel forced young Ethiopian Jews that just got here during the 80s after a long, you know, journey and whatnot to have a second uh, circumcision. And my parents, um, they had to have another one so they would, 
you know, have the official stamp of being Jewish. Because apparently when Ethiopian Jews get to Israel, uh, we weren't Jews enough. Anyway, um, so my mom told me that and I was like 15, 16 years old. And first of all, it was too much information for me. For me. Um, I didn't really went into that, but I just remember that I didn't want to talk about it too much. I just remember that my mom said that and she was very, uh, you know, she didn't uh, expand on that too much. And she said that we didn't want to do that uh, to our community. It's, it's a mark, it's a stain that you're kind of like converted because you're Jewish. Why would you? And my father uh, uh, wouldn't do it. So they didn't get married in the Rabbanut. They just got married, you know, with their own, uh what is the term in, in english i'm not sure um spiritual leaders within the ethiopian community anyway fast forward like almost 15 years i am much uh, aware politically socially and i have my own issues with being black ethiopian jew here in israel and it takes a lot of time for me to understand because um, the thing that I talk about, that, that I just talked about, the fact that my religion is also my nationality, keeps me in, uh, in denial about the fact that I'm being discriminated and it has to do with my skin color and the, the place that my parents came from. Um, and just, just keep in mind that, you know, when people keep doubting your Judaism here in Israel, what does it say about your, your belongingness to the Israeli society? So it creates a lot of tension and issues with my own personal identity. And when I, when I grow older, I, I, I started you know, being more aware and understand the structures of society and ask questions about my, my parents and where they come from and, and their experience with meeting you know, white Jews in, 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 the, uh, in the state of Israel. And then you learn that, you know, my parents' story and the Ethiopian uh, Jewish community here in Israel story is a story of a struggle. Because since, we, since they got here, they had to fight. Why, do they, why did, they, did they have to fight? They had to fight. So the state of Israel, or you can even say the rabbinical institute or the, uh, uh, the Jewish uh, world or the white Jews here in Israel would accept the fact that there are black Jews. They had to fight. So the state of Israel would recognize the fact that Ethiopian Jews are Jews and they do deserve a place here in Israel. Once you get that and you learn that, you understand that, you know, Judaism to me, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's political. It's socio-political. It's not just, you know, it's not just a religion. And unfortunately, to this day, we have discrimination in uh, religion services, religious services. And, you know, when I got married a few years back, I still had to, I, 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 I still had to marry, you know, low profile, just like my parents. Um, when I grew up, I found out that my parents got married back in the day because the rabbinical institution wouldn't let uh, the spiritual leaders of the Ethiopian community to have any authorities and, you know, and even marry people. So my parents uh, got married with those spiritual leaders. It was kind of like a protest activist, large wedding. I was super proud of that. And I, and I knew that as long as, as, as Ethiopian Jews here in Israel can't marry uh, legally, the way that they want to, it's a political and sociological issue. So I got married the same way that my parents did during the first time. Um, anyway, so what what I'm trying to say that I, to us, the, you know, being black and Jewish, it's 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 a super complex issue because the state of Israel, you know, it, it, it has to do, it's, it's a very complicated place, not just because of the, um, uh, the threats that we have from the surrounding area, but it's also, it's a, 
very complicated place, even you know socially and the, the years and years and decades here in Israel, people were trying to shut that out and not and not allow uh, multiple identities. And the fact you know, Rabbi Sanra, you talk about how. Um, how people can identify themselves as Jew of color, and uh, how it's uh, it's a term that um, that someone you know can relate to and identify himself as that. But here in Israel, the fact that I'm black is 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 something that I constantly uh, am, am reminded by, by the society that I am black and that that, that creates a difference. And it's not a self-defense. It's not as self-identified as Sandra mentioned. It's more like the society exactly. defines you. So and it, people here so, don't want to be identified as Jews of color, in my opinion. Yeah, I understand that. So we, it's actually a really good spot now to move on to Felicia and Rabbi Felicia. Now I'm going to put you on the spot, Rabbi Felicia, as as uh, as the non-Jews of color or the white or the Ashkenazi Rabbi in the in the panel. Uh, so first of all, perhaps you can explain the terms of white privilege. We heard it a few times, and it's often used in the context, but it's mostly foreign to us, the Israelis. Uh, we know that in recent history, American Jews uh, identified as its own ethnic minority, and they stood in the past with the civil rights movement, you know, Rabbi Heschel with uh, Martin Luther King. But when did the Ashkenazi Jews start to identify as white? Uh, and and why and in what way do they enjoy white privilege in your opinion and also if you can I'd love you to share a bit also about a uh, about your efforts in your synagogue with the new uh, program that you launched that called race and ask that I heard about uh, which actually you know we we're making more effort or more way to welcome this conversation in the community great well I'm honored to be on the panel um, and uh, thank you for convening the conversation. Um, white privilege is understood as all the things that we don't see and we don't have to work at. Basically, it's the counter story to all the things that Rabbi Sandra and Mazal just described, which is that everything that is noticed um, by Rabbi Sandra and Mazal in how they interact with the world is defined in many ways by their skin color. Um, the questions, the, the, you know, the term here used is microaggressions, that every encounter is, is in a shaded, if you would call it, through the skin color of the person walking, but white people don't experience that at all. Um, I walk in the world, I walk down the street, no one makes any assumptions about me. I mean, they might make plenty, but in the sense, none of that has to do with my skin color. Um, when a policeman sees me on the street, they don't think of me as a threat, whereas America really has been taught for you know 400 years to see black people in particular as a threat. Um, and so when I walk into any synagogue, it doesn't occur to me to check the website. I mean, I may wanna know if I'm counted in the minyan or not because I'm a woman, um, but because I'm white, I walk in the world, you know, the story of the American dream, which was the story of my ancestors. You know, my, my great grandparents came to the United States from Eastern Europe um, with very little, um, very little. Um, and they made their way up the ladder, you know, and this country held out the promise of them for them and, and they fulfilled that and I'm the beneficiary of all the privileges of how that came to be. And that's what white privilege is. Um, and that story of the American dream, which people talk about in very grand terms, was not available and still is not available to so many people, particularly people of color. And in fact, you know, there are many, there, there was a very famous book that came out, I don't know how long it's been, the, um, by Tennessee Coates saying essentially the, the American dream was built on the backs of, of black people. You know, that all the privileges I got in my ancestry have been true because the, essentially even the economics of this country um, were allowed to be because black people weren't, were, did the labor and weren't paid for it. Um, and then they weren't allowed to own land. And, and, and then 
And then the systems that have been built, um, you know, around housing, all these ways that discrimination plays out um, that when you're a white person, you don't really see them because the system works for you. And you consider all your gains in society um, as, you know, people would say that it's a meritocracy. Well, I worked really hard. So I get, you know, I got to go to a good college and have the financial security. And so that's what really the term white privilege means is all the ways that white people are advantaged um, and don't have to work hard at every step of the way because the society essentially was built by them for them. Um, obviously, as a woman, that's not always the case, but, but uh, in terms of whiteness, that is most certainly the case. Um, and uh, so that, that's the answer to that question. Um, you know, I think it's interesting, the question about um, uh, the white Jewish community and uh, the black community and how you know, there's a lot of glory given to that picture of um, Dr. Martin Luther King and Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel. And, you know, certainly actually Heschel, uh, my synagogue, which is B'nai Jeshurun in, on the Upper West Side of New York City, Heschel was the inspiration of the, of the he was actually a Rabbi Marshall T. Meyer, who was the refounding Rabbi of B'nai Jeshurun in 1985. Um, he was Heschel's personal assistant, personal assistant. So, um, he is very central, his ideology is very central to who we are as a community, and we certainly hold him up as a, as a prophet in many ways. Um, and so there's a lot of self-satisfaction in the Jewish community that Dr. Heschel stood with Dr. King um, on the walk, and we hearken back to that moment um, in very grand terms. Um, but for one, the Jews and the civil rights movement were a much more, it was a much more complicated dance um, of how Jews, at least white Jews played in that movement when it comes to money, when it comes to understanding really um, just all the intricacies of the Jewish community wasn't all on the side of justice um, in the South in particular, but also when push to, to shove, we often have preached justice on the outside, but then sustained our privileges on the inside. Um, and so um, one of the things that I, you know, and I, I grew up in a very small white town in Connecticut, had had no racial diversity um, at all, economic diversity, but no racial diversity. And it wasn't until I was in my 20s at actually a conference that when I really, I was, I was being pushed, actually, we were talking about this book, When Jews Became White. Um, there's actually a book called When Jews Became White, which came out, I think, in the late 80s, maybe, mid to late 80s. Do you know, Sandra, when? I don't know, somewhere around there, right? Yeah, something like that, yeah. There's yeah. A, no. yeah. It's a, so the sense is that, um, and, and I, re, it was like, uh, like, like it, the coin drop that I realized, even though I think I'm a good person, you know, and I believe that God, everyone's creating God's image, you know, I have all these principles. I, when I really, when pushed to come to shove, I realized I felt like I was taught to hate, to fear black people. Not because anyone told me that, but because the criminals on the TV shows were black you know, and the sense of not being in relationship with Black people because I didn't live amongst them in my community. So when you don't know someone, you're more fearful of them. And that the society had kind of positioned me in that way. And that realization was kind of a watershed moment for me. Um, it was a long time ago at this point. And ever since then, um, it's been part of my rabbinate um, to really try to dig more deeply into my own kind of, you know, I, I think of him as a moon, their blemishes, you know, no one was, is built to hate people or to feel prejudice, but we have a pure soul and, but society creates these blemishes on us that we actually have to work spiritually to undo. They're not only external issues of justice, they're actually deeply spiritual issues. And so in B'nai Jeshurun, I would say it's probably been 
a 10 year process that I've been going through to try to push these kinds of questions. And it, it took us, I would say, uh, you know, I think it's been five years since Eric Garner um, was killed in Staten Island by a policeman. And he famously said, I can't breathe, although he was one of at least, I think they said 26 people of color have been killed by the police, have, have spoken that very same word in the same way that George Floyd did, that our community started to kind of bubble up in a way that we started channeling the energy. Um, and it wasn't just me giving divrei Torah or a sermon. Um, and we've, so we have, a, um, we have a joint partnership with the church, a longtime partner of ours, that we have a racial justice committee that's working on mass incarceration. Uh, we're partners with a, a group called, um, oh my God, I'm totally, AFJ, it's called Affiliate, Affiliated Families for Justice, Alliance of Families for Justice. Um, we, which is, we read a lot of um, books around these kinds of questions and now we're doing justice work on that. Um, but in some way, more importantly to me, um, we've been doing internal work. Um, we, um, you know, and I would say that the structure of our synagogue, which is a big synagogue, we're about 1,750 families, which is about 4,000 people. And um, pre predominantly white and Ashkenazic, but not exclusively. And our people of color members are both Jews and non-Jews, uh, just to, I think it's important to say. But the structure of our staff is, stuff, is such that there's not a person of color who is in uh, a senior staff position. And the majority of people of color are on the operations and facilities team, which is uh, it's a it's a mirroring of American society in in many ways, um, and there are reasons for that. Um, and so we've been going through a process for about a year and a half. Uh, we have a diversity, equity, and inclusion committee of our staff. We have a diversity, equity, and inclusion committee of our board, and we have one also in the community writ large. And this last year, we did a whole learning, both from a historical perspective. We we also brought Ilana Kaufman, uh, Rabbi Sandra referenced um, the studies that have been done about Jews of color. Ilana reported on that. We did a, re you know, a review of the history of civil rights and the Jews. Um, and we've been, uh, there's been book groups. We've had undoing racism workshops. And in the wake of the George Floyd murder, which, um, which has really, I would say, at the expense, of course, which is not atypical at the life of a person, it's catalyzed more people into the awareness that this is, this is not a, a, a one-shot moment. Uh, this is a life of a, in the history of a country. And so we've made some more commitments and there was a big, I'll, I'll close with this, it's a lot. Um, one, there were three Jews of color who put out a statement um, that, essentially one of whom grew up in my community. Her name is Lindsay Newman, and she's a Jew of color. And she, she along with two friends, put a, a call to the Jewish community to sign on to a statement about seven principles that would help the Jewish, coming, mm -hmm. Jewish community become anti-racist. Um, the metrics that they put out, like that our board should be 20% people of color and our staff as well, um, were, uncomfortable for our uh, leadership to sign on to. They felt it would be disingenuous to promise that we could get to those numbers in a short time. But what it did, and it, what I felt was really powerful, it was the first time that the leadership of Jews of color said to the Jewish community, I need this from you. And that the Jewish community, which is predominantly white, doesn't get to decide, well, I'll take that, but I won't take that. And this is what it means to be justice. You know but they're telling us what they need. And so our community has spent essentially the last five weeks processing those needs and coming up with a, we hear you and this is what we're willing to do. And um, so that's, I, I would say where we've been, it's been a lot of hard work and we have a really long way to go. Um, but it's not, uh, we're not looking for the banner of being, um, you know, justice, I, we're looking for the change to be embodied in who we are. That's actually a great 
uh, way to link back to Sandra uh, as a follow-up question that we have for her. It's, uh, you know, the discrimination in America been there. It's an old thing, a phenomenon that we feel away. And Jews of color look like it's, a, it's, I know it's existed for the last 20 years, or maybe the terminology, it's only now becoming so big among the Jewish community. But as you described before, it's really dependent which community and where you go and how each of the three, four uh, define themselves. Uh, but following uh, what Felicia just said, uh, what are Jews of color as a movement demanding from the Ashkenazi Jewish establishment? What for you, for people of color that you know among the Jewish community, what do you demand? Um, yeah, so I, 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 I'm stumbling because I'm having difficulty answering the question. One, I'm just, I, I love Lindsay Newman and um, I think she's great and I'm so glad that, that, that she has a connection with Rabbi Felicia. Um, so I know I saw the seven items. It's actually a great thing. I never saw something such in structure like that. I'm personally not, not sure that if every Jewish organization will really take and embrace all of the seven. But we signed it. I mean, it's interesting because our the our Hillel signed it. Um, we had our we are have we're having those conversations and we're making a, an effort um, to meet those goals. And we also know that our, our racial demographics are shifting. I mean, we already know that there are three Jews of color that are entering campus um, and, um, and we're trying to, to bring them in. But, you know, so I'm not part of, I mean, I'm, I sign petitions and things like that, but I'm not part of a um, predominantly Jew of color organization with the exception of the Cholo Shon. I'm part of their speaker. I'm on their speaker's bureau, which is just basically means Rabbi Ruth calls me and asks me for things. And I most of the time say yes, because I just think she's awesome. Um, <laughs> um, but what I'll say is, is Sandra, um, I support all the things that were in that document that, um, um, that was led by Lindsay and I think Aaron Samuels and, and someone else. Um, and I, I, but what I want to see as a rabbi, um, I know, I have an idea of the rabbinical students that are coming through the pipeline. And uh, many of them are brown, many of them are black, um, you know, many of them are not gender binary. Um, and I want, uh, as one of the first like wave of black female rabbis or black rabbis, I want um, to make, I want a world to be better for them when they are ordained or have smicha or graduate or whatever. Um, so they don't, they could just be rabbis um, and, and not face the racial biases. Every single black rabbi that I know, actually every single Jew of color rabbi that I know. And again, you know, I, I have friends who are people of color who are not black. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they may have some other kind of, another kind of ancestry. Every single rabbi of color that I know who's, out, who's not outwardly presenting as white has faced racial bias in the hiring process. And so, um, and, 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 and that is something the Jewish community is going to have to um, understand or, or, or d d deal with. Uh, and that's what I want. I want, um, you know, the, 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 the white people who have children of color and my friends who were people of color and have children of color, I want a Jewish world where they can just be Jewish, um, they're going to still face racism outside the Jewish community, but the Jewish community really needs to reckon uh, with um, the racism that exists in, in our own communities. And I really love what Felicia is saying about the internal work, because I do think that American Jews as a whole are really doing a pretty good job when it comes to dealing with racism outside of the Jewish community where we fail is doing the internal work that we need to do. And I just got off the phone with a rabbi who gave, who reached out to me because she's struggling trying to figure this out. One of the things I said to her um, when she was, because she grew up in the South and, 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 and lives in the North. Um, and I, and, and she was talking about the racism in the South. And I said, you do know there's racism all over the entire country, right? Um, and she's like, I know, but she didn't want to want to deal with it. Um, but, you know, I just want, um, yeah, I just want us to really do the internal work that we need to do um, so that our, our children, our grandchildren um, can just be Jewish and, you know, uh, and, 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 and all of our narratives. I mean, that's the thing, like, you know, we're in a country that, that celebrates a particular narrative and the Jewish community celebrates a particular narrative. Um, and I can't remember how Mazel phrased it. Um, 
uh, Mono Monopoly, which I love, um, that that's, we, when, if, when we start to tell all the stories of Jews and all the stories of all the people in this country, we will heal um, and we will grow and we'll have a fuller understanding of what it means to be Jewish in America. Oh, thank you. So, Mazal, um, you know, I was, I, I'm wondering as an Ethiopian Jew, like, what do we as Israelis can learn from those shifts that are happening in American Jewry? And in what ways, you know, the Ethiopian Jewish community organizing nowadays in Israel can, you know, take away some, some from what Sandra is sharing and what is Felicia is sharing as, as part of the Jewish community uh, to bring to a change in the Israel, in Israel society today? If any. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that we may be able, you know, when I'm saying we, I'm talking about Ethiopian Jews here in Israel, we may be able to, um, to teach or to be, to say something about how, about the experience of being uh, Black and Jewish, because it's something, it's, it's our story and we're dealing with it for like over 30 years. When I'm thinking about what we can take from them, I think that um, the advantage, I think that I said something about it earlier, the advantage that when we're talking about, for example, about America, um, the advantage that they have is the fact that racism is something that is out there. People are talking about it. They have uh, decades of confronting that issue. Of course, that racism still exists and it's dangerous and it gets black people killed and it's, of course, I'm not. But, you know, the fact that there is a discourse about it, the fact that, you know, that you can say about something that it's racist or you can just use that word and people will be a little bit more sensitive or even even though they they might be defensive about it or but it's it's a it's a well known issue um i think that it gives them the uh, it gives them the advantage to be open to the fact that they need to do some work about it um, it's, 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 in my opinion, it's the biggest obstacle that we have here in terms of, you know, even when you're talking socially with people or when we're trying to do our work in, uh, with uh, government uh, representative and police, you know, the, the forest that we uh, got to is talking about cultural differences. And even that is basically racist you know, to say to someone that, uh, you know, the police is basically saying, yeah, we're shooting you and we're profiling you and we're killing you because there's cultural difference, differences between us. Even though almost half of Ethiopian Jews in Israel were born and raised in Israel. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. The fact that, it's an interesting example to the, uh, to the abroad audience. The fact that during last year when we had the huge uh, demonstrations because of Salomon Seca's shooting, one of the things that the police department wanted to do is to send officers to a trip, to a journey in Ethiopia so they would learn about you know, the Ethiopian culture so they would know how to, um, how to react to us. So... <laughs> The fact that there's almost no discourse here is something that we really try to work on. And we, at least AJ, you know, and, and myself, we do use uh, the work that has already been done in America. And we're trying to, you know, the fact that I'm sitting here and, and, I, and I call myself black and I use the word black, it's not so obvious. You know, I'm guessing that a few years back, 10 years ago, I don't know if Ethiopian Jews would use that word to describe themselves. They would look at that word as, as something that is extremely offensive. But today, I know that being Black is political. 
it shapes the way that the government and other people in the society treats me. So I'm reclaiming that and I'm owning that and it's, it, and it's part of me and it's important for me to be able to, uh, to say that and to own that. And, and one of the things that are happening right now also within the Ethiopian community is, is being able to be in touch with that, uh, with that term and uh, much more uh, many young people are, are starting to identify themselves as black because they understand that the fact that they are black has a strong connection to the way that they feel every time they leave their house, every time they interact with other people here in Israel. So I, I don't know if I answered the question, but I was trying to say that the fact that we don't have any discourse here about racism is extremely is extremely problematic, and and what we need to learn is how to um, how to create that discourse and and to take terms and you know microaggression, profiling, shooting bias, um, whatever uh, is stuff that I, I'm hoping to import here because we need to give the situations and the feelings that we have award. Uh, we need to to. We need to be able to talk about it. And hopefully, once we can talk at the same level and use the same language, we can also start working. Because if I'm talking racism and you're talking cultural uh, sensitivity or cultural gaps, then we're not talking the same language. We're not talking about the same thing. So, that, so before, we, uh, before we get to the last question, which will be for to all of you. I just wanna uh, say it loud and clear that we're gonna open the chat now for questions because I'm getting getting some WhatsApp uh, text about asking questions. So I know there's some people waiting to ask you their own questions. So meanwhile, uh, while we open the chat for the audience, uh, we would like to ask you shortly if you can answer that, three of you, and we will start with Felicia. Um, to share where you believe the Jewish people is hidden in regards to issues of race and color and what needs to change. So we'll start with you, Felicia, and then Sandra and Mazal, and the floor is open for questions as well at the same time. What, can you say the question again? What sure, better. Can you share where you believe the Jewish people is hidden in regards headed. to issues of oh, in Slicha? That's okay. The issues of race and color and what needs to be changed. I mean, I do believe that uh, at least the, the more progressive Jewish community is on its way. I think uh, we've had the United States writ large is in, a, I think, really at a breaking point um, mm -hmm. of which the Jewish community is part and parcel. And so I don't think at this point, most Jewish communities can ignore um, the profundity of racism in the country um, and how that impacts people of color uh, of whom are walking in our doors. And Sandra is exactly right. Our demographics are changing and we mirror, we're like 20 years behind the Jewish, the regular community. So I feel that the brokenness is starting to be felt and once you feel the brokenness, you want to do something about it. And that is not only from an external perspective. We've been called countless times over the last, you know, bunch of months, how did you get going on this work? And so my hope and prayer is that the brokenness actually will lead to some healing. And sometimes I think, right, like the principle, Yeri Dalitzora Khalia, you know, that we have to really go to the worst in order to to rise. So now, Sandra? So um, I agree with everything that Felicia said. Um, I'm going to add um, a little bit more that may be a little darker, I'm not sure, but, uh, but I do agree with what Felicia is saying, so I'm just going to add this piece. Um, I've been on a lot of these calls, um, and, and even when before COVID, when I would travel to different communities and talk, um, I, I do believe that we are headed in the right direction, at least progressive communities. But there are, there are many in the Jewish community that are still holding on to a particular narrative. And that narrative often sounds like all that we did, you know, during the civil rights movement. And 
um, Felicia touched on this a little bit, but you know, the Jewish community during that time period um, was complicated and just like it is today. And yes, Heschel, awesome. <laughs> you know, I, the fact that Heschel and King were like bros, like that, that's pretty, that's pretty cool. Um, but you know, the, the, the rest of the Jewish community was way more, you know, comp, comp, that issue was more complicated. Like rabbis who did step, step up, I've heard stories and read narratives of how their community is like, why are you spending all this time with black people? Why don't you like what's going on and take care of what's going on here? And also I mean, many of the Jewish community still had the same racism that the larger American population had. And also to, to add to that, the narratives that we tell about allyship um, you know, the, the, how Jews helped to found, found the NAACP, that's true. Um, and, 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 and the narrative that the Jewish community lifts up without bringing in the Black narrative of how those relationships sort of dissolved. Um, I was in a call and this came up twice, um, you know, the, and it went something like, you know, Jews helped found the NAACP and then they kicked us out. Um, and without um, telling that person, <laughs> no, that's not what happened, what I said, I reframed it and made her think about it. And there's two people. So the one I talked to and the one who else was in the chat, um, you know, the, um, the reframing. And I said, Al, let's talk about allyship. So if you're going to help a group of people have equity and, and be self-sustaining and help them create a civil rights movement that's sort of modeled after the Anti-Defamation League, um, at some point, they need to be self-governing. They need to own that organization themselves. And, and so that was, that was a framing that she had never thought about because in her mind, um, you know, Black people were, and, and she wasn't mean, but that's what she was told, that Black people were ungrateful. Um, and then there was a fallout in the civil rights movement. So, you know, so many in the Jewish community hold on to this narrative that, um, that, 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 that Black people um, or anti-Semitic or that Black people, you know, didn't want help from the Jewish, or whatever the story is, but like, you know, sort of getting the Jewish community to reframe the narrative that they have, that um, yes, King Mar yes, King and uh, Heschel were friends, and yes, they, they marched together. That was 1960, whatever year that was. <laughs> um, let's talk about today, and then let's just not, let's not confuse Martin Luther King Day with Heschel Day, um, because that also happens in the Jewish community. And so when we start to do that and have a fuller understanding of our history, you know, then you know, the Jewish community will be much, much further along. So I'm just adding that without I'm not trying to take anything away from what Felicia said, because I actually agree with her, but I'm just adding that piece. Mazal. First, I would like to say to Rabbi Sandra, don't apologize. Um, <laughs> I think that it's very important to say those things, and I and I so uh, agree with what you're saying because uh, you know we also have it here, uh, specifically specifically with uh, Martin Luther King Day. You know, I worked for a few years in the liberal kind of like uh, pluralist pluralist uh, Jewish organization. I was the only Ethiopian Jewish person in there. Needless to say that I had to fight for every uh, uh, stage or platform to, you know, to bring myself to, to, that, to that story. Super Ashkenazi, super el elitist. And each year when we got to Martin Luther King, they used to promote it. And, you know, that famous picture with Dr. King and, and Rabbi Heschel and it was amazing to me, you know, to how, you know, it, it's not like we're even in the States, we're here in Israel. And that how can a Jewish, white, elitist community here in Israel can take credit over things that a Jewish uh, person or Jewish people did back in the 60s when they're here in South Tel Aviv, in uh, in uh, in uh, uh, difficult neighborhoods, surrounded by black people, most of them refugees, having no connection to them, but you know, still want to take credit and you know, um, stamp themselves with the stamp of you know, liberal and you know, um, you know, Jewish as a as a liberal ish is a liberal uh, concept, and when they have. A black person in their uh, NGO 
that is being frustrated by the fact that, you know, there's nothing here to represent. Um, anyway, I left them. Now I'm working at AJ. Uh, but it's 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 a it's very important because I sit in in the Ethiopian um, uh, uh, Jewish context here in Israel. We hear that when people talk about the way that you know um, my parents came to Israel, the state of Israel loves to take credit over the horrifying journey and sacrifice that Ethiopian Jews did to get to Israel. And the narrative here is is narrative of, you know, we rescued, people are using the word rescue. We rescued you from Ethiopia, from hunger, from whatever. When basically, you know, our narrative is a narrative of, you know, my parents, they did the action, they did the struggle, they did the journey, and they fought with the state of Israel for, uh, you know, for the, the option to be a free Jewish people in a, in a Jewish state. And, and it's, it's very important. It's important to confront the white Jewish communities uh, with that issue, because in my opinion, that's the only way to, to go forward you know, to, to evolve from, uh, from where we are right now. And unfortunately here, people are getting very defensive and even aggressive when you confront them with that, um, with those issues. But we can't be apologetic and we cannot be uh, afraid of saying those things because that's the only way for, in my opinion, to a change. Toda. So we got uh, four to five great questions, if I'm not wrong. Uh, so I will ask you to try to answer shortly because we have 20 minutes. And, uh, and I'm sure we're going to have uh, maybe more coming through. So when it's, uh, when it's uh, um, uh, direct to one of you, I will mention your name. But right now, for example, uh, the first question is, what does it look like to be an ally for Jews of color? We heard a bit about what it's cool to look like in the U.S. through the words of Felicia, but what about in Israel? So, Masal, do you want to answer that? And please, um, please make sure that you're answering shortly. Oops, I'm just for that. Yeah, can, can you repeat the question again? Sure, yes. Uh, I think you can see it also in the chat if it's easier for you, but it's what does it look like to be an ally for Jews of color? We heard a bit about what it's could look like in the U.S. through the words of Felicia, but what about in Israel? Uh, okay, first of all, I would say that being an ally means being an ally all year long, not in uh, not only in the specific you know incidents that we have, and being an ally is um, is is working. Is, is having an opinion, is not uh, avoiding from dealing with that issue, is asking yourself questions about your privilege, is, you know, other than, you know, going to demonstrations and stuff like that, or volunteering, or I want to say something not about, not necessarily about actions, but taking a stand. To be an ally is taking a stand against racism. Uh, is taking a stand against the practices of, of discrimination from the rabbinical institution. It's taking a stand, not just be passive about it or you know, wait for something to happen to, to deal with that issue. It's like, in my opinion, it's also, you know, it's not about not being racist, it's about being anti-racist. That's, it's a difference between being passive about things and being active and interacting with it. Yeah. So that. Uh, the second question is uh, many Israelis have a hard time understanding how Jews can support the Black Lives Matter movement, which often identified as a pro Palestinian. Others find it challenging because of the demonstrations following the murder of George Floyd that were accompanied by vandalism that was also directed through Jewish institution. And because of the rays of an anti-Semitism act on behalf of black aggressors, 
How will you, how will each of you respond to this claim? Wow, that's a good question. Thank you, Moshe Samuels. <laughs> so, um, first of all, I will, I, 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 could, I, I, I get questions like this a lot, but first of all, I want to say sure. <laughs> property is very different than human life. I'll just say that. Um, and so um, there, was a, there was a piece in the New York Times a few weeks ago where um, um, uh, I think an, uh, an Arab man's business was, being, was burnt, being burned down by protesters and he told his family let it burn because somebody died, um, somebody was murdered. So I'll just say that. The other thing is that the phrase Black Lives Matter is a, is a, is a phrase, it's a chant, it's a call, rall, rallying call that started around Ferguson. This is before you know, an organization started. Now, Organizations that fall under Black Lives Matter, there are multiple, multiple, multiple organizations that um, use that title now. But this is grassroots organization. This is not, you know, like a big structure with hierarchies and everybody falls in line. And so I'm trying to keep this short and I'm happy to follow, follow up later with somebody who wants to talk more deeply about this. But anti-Semitism exists throughout our entire country, largely because we are a Christian-centric country. And so in the, in the history of Christianity is, is loaded with anti-Semitism. So that means that everyone in our country, just like everyone in our country is affected by racism, everyone in our country is affected by anti-Semitism. So yes, there are probably people in, uh, who support Black Lives Matter who are also anti-Semitic. Both things can be true. But to say that Black Lives Matter is inherently anti-Semitic is wrong and racist. <laughs> so, and that, and also calling out black people who are anti-Semitic in a stronger way without calling out white organizations that are anti-Semitic is also racist. So um, that's a short answer. I could unpack it more later, <laughs> but yeah. Alicia, I you want to add? add a, yeah, I would add a couple things. I mean, I agree. So one, I think by, um, there's a clumping together uh, that assumes everyone's the same. And there are, right, as Sandra said, that it's a statement. There's an organization called Black Lives Matter. And then there's a movement for Black Lives, which is something else, which is where the platform came out, um, where people, the Jewish community went kind of haywire around a handful of words around anti-Zionism. Um, so a couple of things I wanna say is that just as Jews feel deeply unknown um, in terms of how anti-Semitism plays out and most of the people that act in those ways don't have deep relationships with Jews, the same is true um, for the white Jewish community and to have proximity to black communities, even if Jews are in the Jewish community. That if we don't know people who are engaged in these movements, if we don't have relationships, if we're not asking questions, if we don't understand why people are feeling this way, who are we to make some grand statement that the black community is anti-Semitic or anti-Zionist? Um, so that's one thing I would say. And I think to have some humility, and this is where I think um, the sense of power that the Jewish community has to call out an entire race of people in a certain way because we actually have a platform to do so. Um, we have newspaper articles, we have money and all these different ways, which is not anti-Semitic to say so, it's true. There are many Jews that have platforms and we have to own that. It's not a bad thing. Um, and, it doesn't, and it does sometimes trick into anti-Semitic tropes, but it doesn't mean that we don't use our powers as, as Jews um, with our privileges. Um, and I think it's really important to know that Jews are speaking without understanding even the organizations. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's false, that's one. The second thing is, and I think this is something um, that pertains also um, to Palestinians. If you don't understand the Palestinian experience um, and are proximate to Palestinians, whether you're a Jew in America or you're just, you know, in the neighboring, you know, settlement. Um, I think one doesn't understand the relationship and the stories that are actually sound very similar. So um, we heard Mazal speak and we heard Sander speak about the experience of being black, um, both in Israel and in America the same stories will come out of Palestinians' mouths. 
because I've heard them. Um, I've spent time uh, with Palestinians uh, in trips and we've had speakers in my synagogue. It doesn't mean all Palestinians are anything. It just means there's an alignment that we might want to seek to understand why there's an alignment because of the lived experience, which has had obviously political implications, whether you agree with BDS or you don't believe with BDS or you think all Palestinians are terrorists, whatever your designs about who those people are. I have been over the last couple of years and you know, I've, I've spent a decent amount of time in in those kind of conversations, it's been kind of astonishing to me how the words and the languaging of the lived experience is the same. And I think the Jewish community has to wrestle with that. And, and it's gonna get worse if annexation moves forward. Um, you know, uh, the, and the Jewish community in America is gonna happen, it's gonna have to be taken to task to whether it's gonna risk its allegiance to Israel um, by also being willing to stand for Black people in America. And I don't want to have to choose. I don't want to have to choose, but the Jewish mainstream community is sometimes asking us implicitly to choose, which I think is a bad question. Don't, we shouldn't have to be asked. We should be fighting for justice and dignity for all. It's not a simple process. And it's, in, you know, years of ingrained isms um, and we have to be willing to face those. We can't walk away and we can't make them simple. Um, and I, I, I mean, I have really strong feelings about that. I have a lot of resentment about the way the Jewish community plays around Black Lives America because I think it's deeply in, ingrained in racism, actually. Alicia, actually, we have a great follow-up question, which is... Uh, wait, wait, Nina, I, I, I No, no, wait, wait, Mazel, Mazel, no, 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 Mazel Haki. You're going to address that in the next question because it's a direct okay. to you, Mazal, and it's related to what Felicia said. So let's do it. Let's link this because we have 10 minutes. Uh, I'm okay. sorry. And we have uh, three more questions. So we have a great question that actually following exactly what you just mentioned, Felicia. Uh, from Noam Meir, she's asking Mazal, you mentioned that there is, isn't it civil discourse in Israel about racism, which is absolutely true. When there is a talk of racism, it focuses more on the Israeli Arab Palestinian. Do you find that the Ethiopian community and the Israeli Arab sector could join forces in surfacing racism in our civil discourse in Israel? My turn? Ken, for that okay. question. First, you were right. I should have waited because that's exactly what I wanted to say. Um, I, I know you'll say <laughs> Um, first of all, uh, yes, there is a strong connection. What I wanted to say is that, in my opinion, the fact, the, the things that um, that that were uh, brought up in that question is is an outcome of the fact that we don't have any serious discourse. When we don't have a discourse, it's basically you know showing that the problem is also with the perspective about racism and, and, and the understanding of racism and, and, and seeing, seeing it as a complex thing that also have connection to other groups in society. I was saying earlier that to me, to be able to identify myself as black is kind of like, a, it's an achievement uh, in my opinion. And you know, the, uh, the next step is to also understand that the discrimination and racism that I experience has to do with the fact that I am a minority here in Israel. And there are other minorities that are suffering from the same thing. And I can absolutely relate to their experience. You know, I, we can't talk about racism only towards uh, uh, Black people or Ethiopian Jews here in Israel. Um, and in my opinion, since we can't do that. We can also not, we can't talk about anti-Semitism without saying something about racism. To me, it's like, it's, it's, it's just, it just is the same understanding that I have that being black uh, has, you know, similarities and things in common uh, uh, with uh, uh, being Palestinian here in Israel. So uh, I, I absolutely believe 
and see the, uh, the similarities in terms of institutionalized discrimination, uh, the treatment that you know, uh, Israeli Palestinians have, and, and also uh, that you know, Israeli people sitting here and 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 giving judgment and criticism about demonstration outside of Israel, you know, uh, it's it's the classic defensive deflecting move of Israeli people not willing to deal with issues of racism. You know, we had the same, uh, uh, the same arguments about, you know, uh, violence and vandalism. Also here, when we had, you know, a demonstration after two young Ethiopian uh, uh, men uh, were shot and killed by police, they were saying the same things. So excuse me if I'm not, you know, taking that criticism super seriously. Israeli people here have the tendency to either criticize or relate or interact with issues abroad uh, other than uh, issues here with us. So uh, that, that's, that's a classic defensive move. You wanna, you, you're talking about racism and they're like, oh yeah, they're looting and, the, and there's violence over there. Yeah, but what, what are you doing here? And mind you, right now, uh, white people are getting beat up and experiences police brutality here in Israel, and they are shocked and they are overwhelmed. And you know, when when we had that protest last year, they were saying stuff to the Ethiopian community like, "You lost us. You don't have our support." So. Anyway, to me, that argument is just an expression of how far behind with, we are uh, uh, with everything that has to do with talking about racism and fighting racism and, you know, whatever. And also, I forgot to mention something during my last um, answer, which is, if you want to be an ally, you can also donate to AEJ. <laughs> That's it. I said it. Okay, so uh, considering the time, we have two questions. If you can promise you're going to answer them shortly. Uh, so Rabbi Sandra, there's one for you uh, from your Yoav Viron. I was wondering if while visiting in Israel, you felt the same or different while practicing your Judaism. What do you think we as educators should do to help the situation? So um, my situation is a little different. I didn't visit Israel. I actually lived there. It was a requirement for rabbinical school. And I, um, I went to Israel with a lot of uh, internal armor. Um, I had heard a lot of stories um, from uh, black friends who, you know, going through security and I just, I just needed to study, like I needed to study so that I could be ordained. And so when I went to Israel, I went to Israel with no iconography, no, no Star of David bracelets, no, no uh, talitot in my suitcase, um, because I presented myself as a tourist. That was a decision that I made so that I could um, not have to worry about um, being discriminated uh, against for being a Jew. I just wanted to experience the country and I wanted to enjoy it as much as, as I possibly could. With that said though, when people would see me, I would just, you know, and I would get in relationships with people that I, they'd ask me what I was doing. And I was like, I'm a rental student, like, oh, great. Um, my other challenge, which I was not prepared for, was that I am a, a sort of a non-gender conforming female. <laughs> and so I do identify as a woman, but I don't dress the same, I didn't dress the same way as many of the women that I saw in Jerusalem. So I was often, um, uh, when I, I was uh, sort of hit, <laughs> I'm saying that lightly, um, when I was at the Western Wall and told to go to the men's side and I had to basically grab my boobs to, to tell the Haredi woman that I was on the right, the correct side. Um, and um, and I also had heard stories of women who wear uh, kippot, uh, yarmulkes in, in Israel, and I didn't want to have to d deal with that. Um, so, um, and I was, I was hanging out with some friends one day and some guy who had mental issues and mental challenges, um, yelled at me really quickly in, in Hebrew and called me a terrorist. Um, I was with friends who shielded me and protected me. Um, and I didn't think anything of it until I got home and I was like, oh my God, what if I was alone? So my experience is, is sort of all wrapped up in my blackness, in my queerness, in my non- female presenting self, um, which had a lot to do with how I experienced Israel. 
So, or more yeah. specifically, Jerusalem, because when I was in Tel Aviv, it was very different. I was like, Whoo! Tel Aviv is a different country. You need a passport to move to, you know, yeah. even in Israel. So the last question, and we're going to close up, is uh, from Ilan Izrahi. What are your thoughts about the debate that took place a few weeks ago regarding the number of Jews of color in America? How many Jews of color are there in your opinion? So I, I'll just, I'll just start. So I think what they're talking about is, is the essay that was uh, posted by two scholars okay. sort of focusing on the number of the two other studies. And I, you know, and there was a lot of pushback on that article, if that's what you're talking, the Jewish philanthropy art article. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I'm not, referring to that. I think that it's the, the wrong discussion is how many Jews of color are there? There are Jews of color, and we need to start acting like they're Jews of color. And that's and I, there have been multiple studies, and all those studies put the number somewhere between ten to fifteen to twenty. And and I I use those numbers um, to sort of highlight that that the, the growing number of of uh, of the, the diversity of that is the Jewish people in the United States. But I don't want to get I don't I don't I think the discussion around how many. I don't, I don't think that's where we need to, to be spending our energy. Yeah, I would, just, I would okay. just add that I think, you know, the pushback was that in, in making it about numbers, you erase the truth of the existence of Jews of color. And so I think, and the way that article was entitled, um, essentially, and Jews of color have trouble being believed all the time. And so what the article in some way manifested, I think all the fears that are realized in Jewish community, which is you have to prove yourself and you're always being asked, are you good enough? Are you Jewish enough? Right. Or did you convert right? And, and so in some way I felt like the, what the, I think the pushback came um, because of the, a kind of, uh, and in, like it was like a macro aggression on all the progress that has been made um, about saying actually there's a substantive Jewish community of Jews of color, whether it's 7% or eight, who cares ultimately if it's 5% or 25, that's a decent number of people, you know, and so we should think about what it means to have a debate of someone's existence, um, which is, I think, why it was so inflammatory. Although I think it's meritorious to have good numbers in a certain sphere, but if it questions the, the, um, the human um, quality of what it means to be a person in the Jewish community as a person of color and erases or dismisses, it becomes extremely problematic. To Daba to all of you. I, I want to apologize for those that did send a, a questions and we couldn't uh, answer those. Uh, but to Daraba, to Rabbi Sandra, Rabbi Felicia and Mazal for participating, enlightening us, sharing your own uh, experience, thought and knowledge. I think it was a very interesting and important conversation to have to just start actually. And hopefully we'll go on uh, in other sessions like that. I want to thank Moshe Samuels for joining us at the Jewish Agency to, let, to create this webinar uh, for the people. It started, as he mentioned, with the members of the Jewish People Coalition, but it's grown to other people out of the coalition. As to that, and uh, may we all continue to talk and have a dialogue with each other about those identities and have our people welcome into the Jewish people and into the Jewish family. תודה. תודה.